Hello. I am here with Mrs. Dolores Hayes, a renowned teacher from Goldsboro and the widow of the late Dr. Lonnie Hayes. Mrs. Hayes has agreed to talk to us today and be interviewed um, to preserve some of her vast knowledge. And she's got some amazing stories. And um, just wanted to talk to her um, about um, some of her memories. And you moved here went 19, in the 1960s, 1960, 1963. 1963, and you moved here because Dr. Hayes had did, chosen Goldsboro mm -hmm. to be the uh, town in this part of North Carolina uh -huh. for his medical practice. And he was the first African-American surgeon at Wayne Memorial Hospital, right? That's correct. Okay, and you guys met, was he at Howard when you met? He was at Howard, but he had come home to mm -hmm. Windsor, North Carolina uh -huh. for his sister's wedding. And did you guys meet at the wedding? We met at the wedding. Uh huh. He and was a groomsman, and I was a bridesmaid. Oh, it's just like a movie. It's like a it's like a romantic comedy. And so you met at the wedding, and um, did you did you hit it off immediately? Yes, um, we sort of hit it off. He was pretty cute. I've seen the pictures. He yeah. he's pretty irresistible. Um, and so you guys hit it off, and but then you you went back home, right? Or he went back home. Went back home because this was in the summer. Mm -hmm. School was out. Yeah. And so, and how how did that happen? Did he court you long distance? Well, no, he came to visit me in yeah. Virgo. Uh huh. And um, and was, were you were in school there, or you were no, teaching already? I was teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, his sister and I taught together. Ah, so that's how you were at the wedding. Yeah, he okay. in a little town uh, called Kingsville. We became close friends, mm -hmm. and she got married that summer. Yeah, and asked me to be in her wedding, and that's went to Windsor. I had been to Windsor before. Yeah, um, with her, and she would come to Berg all with me, uh -huh. and then we would go to various places. Um, on weekends, because Kenansville is a small town also, but yeah. it is the capital, uh, I guess you call it the capital of Duplin County. Okay. But it, all of Duplin and Pender and in this area mm -hmm. are really very um, rural type mm -hmm. places, and we mostly have just crossroads or small towns. Yeah, and so you guys, you fell in love? Well, not big. <laughs> <laughs> it was a process. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I told my mother, uh -huh. there's no way I can go back to Kenansville without Myra. She has gone on with her husband in a new life. Uh huh. And the teachers at the school, E.E. E. Smith High School in Kenansville, were very nice, but they were seniors, veteran teachers. Uh huh. And very nice to me and the younger teachers. So I said, Mama, I want to go get my master's. She said, okay, where do you want to go? I said, uh, George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Nice. <laughs> my husband, What'd she say? She said, okay. Okay. Because she knew Virgo was not a place. It was not big people. enough for you. Uh, yeah. One movie house that only changed once a week. Yeah. And um, one red light, one yeah. restaurant. Only one. Only one. Yeah. So Re what? What? what, was what the name of it Reeds. 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 So what was the population? You think? <laughs> like. Oh, about twenty five hundred. Oh, okay. All and right. that was the biggest town in Pender County. Wow. So, anyway, yeah. I picked George Washington of all of the great universities. That's a good one. And yeah. So Lonnie told everybody, all his people, she followed me to Washington. Oh. <laughs> and I said, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, I went to Washington. Yeah. But at that time... I got a job at the National Institutes of Health. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. this is so interesting. Now, and you were doing, like, research on... Research. Cancer? Cancer. Cancer, yeah. And so, um, 
my doctor at that institute, there are five institutes there, mm-hmm. uh, but he was doing research on whether or not his ideas about uh, how to stimulate getting fat on people. Have you ever noticed how people with cancer just... Mm-hmm. Right, the wasting, yeah, right? Yeah, just mm-hmm. waste the weight. Mm-hmm. And so one day I went to work. I thought I was something in my lab outfit. I, I bet you I bet you were very glamorous. <laughs> I bet you were. No. Uh, walked into my desk and the doctor had a note and said he wanted me to dissect Callahan's liver. Oh and Mr. Callahan was a gentleman I had met on the ward and oh. had said goodbye to him that Friday. Oh no. Came back there that one day. Oh, and I cried. I'm very emotional. Oh, my. Well, that's quite... He didn't give you any kind of warning at all? Everybody that goes to those uh, Mm -hmm. uh, experimental hospitals, Mm -hmm. they know that's the last resort. Yeah. And And they're they're donating their their bodies to science, right, to further a, a cure. Right. But, oh, my. So I cried, and I cried, so... And did that? Did that? Said, you can't do this. Did that ruin your medical career? <laughs> that ruined my, <laughs> the end of my medical career. But oh, that's a terrible. I story. also had a double major in social studies. Ah. But up there, uh-huh. I went into teaching. I had a teaching degree, and so I went into teaching. Uh-huh. And uh, but I taught science in in Maryland. You taught science rather than social studies. Right. I, I guess you have to teach what they have a need for, right? Or, yeah. Okay. Well, that was my major, biology yeah. and chemistry. Oh, right, because when you had worked in the medical field. Yeah. Right, okay. So then, um, 1963, this is the height of the Civil Rights Revolution. Right. 1963 right. was when Martin Luther King made his famous speech, yes, ma'am. I Have a Dream. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Lonnie had gotten a grant for to go to medical school. Mm-hmm. But UNC Chapel Hill, Duke, Wake Forest, all the great medical schools here in North Carolina were mm-hmm. not taking blacks. So uh, he went to get his medical degree at Howard. Howard. And... So then he got his residency in general surgery, Uh and that's where he was in attendance at uh, the hospital there in Washington, the big hospital there. Uh And so when he finished, the only stipulation was that he had to come back to a small town, small place Uh in eastern North Carolina where there was a shortage of doctors. And that's how you ended up here. And that's how we ended up here. There were several places that he had looked at. Uh-huh. Um, High Point, for one, uh-huh. met the criteria. Yeah. Even though it was not eastern North Carolina, but it was a small town. And so how did you guys decide on Goldsboro? Well, he decided. Uh-huh. Did he come do tour the cities? Yeah. and? Well, a group of uh, citizens uh, from Goldsboro. Mm-hmm. Uh, the dentist, Dr. Stovall, mm-hmm. uh, the funeral director, very prominent civic worker, Mrs. Geneva Hamilton. Yes, yeah, she was a civil rights organizer. She yeah, was. she's in our exhibit. Yeah. So uh, at that time, Harry in Tennessee and Howard University in Washington, D.C., mm-hmm. were the two predominant black uh, medical universities. Mm-hmm. So they came up there. And they met Lonnie, mm-hmm. and they said, we we need a black doctor. Right. And so he came down and looked around, and he came back, and he told me, he said, Dolores, I think I've decided on Goldsboro. Well, I was fine with that, because yeah. Burgo is about 60, 65 miles from Goldsboro. Oh, that so be- I could see my mama and... Oh, close to home then. Okay. Well, that helps ease the culture shock a bit. Yeah. It wasn't the part of um, Goldsboro being a small town. 
Yeah. Even though um, we had season tickets to the Washington Redskins. Yeah. And of course, I enjoyed even then museums and going to the theater. Theater. And all yeah, that. it had to be a culture shock. There was not much here in terms of uh, cultural amenities, I would imagine, back then. So. The men that moved us in the U-Haul, they came in and yeah. crashed for a few hours. And I, uh, they went on back to Washington. Yeah. And Lonnie got up and went to his office that he had already... Already set up? Set up. Uh-huh. And I sat there in the middle of all of those boxes and this <laughs> and that and oh, no. It was just a crime. I don't blame you. <laughs> so, oh what my am gosh! What going to do? About that time, a knock came on the door, and it was my next door neighbor. Yeah. And uh, he was a minister. He said, "Good morning. <laughs> I am Bishop Melvin, and I'm your next door neighbor. Why are you crying?" Oh. I said, "I don't know what to do." Look at this mess. Yeah. <laughs> Where do I start? He said, go next door and tell Ada, his wife, uh -huh. to give you a cup of coffee, and I'm going and bring back some help. Yeah. And he came and brought back help. I sat over there and had breakfast and drank coffee, and um, they got everything situated. Really? Then... Um, Ada and her mother-in-law had cooked a big pot of chicken pastry. Uh huh. They didn't even mm -hmm. put it in bowls. They brought the whole pot over there. Wow. And they had washed the cabinet, you know, and put the dishes up, oh. had the table set. And when Dr. Hayes came in that evening, he came to a good hot meal. He thought you were really something. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And so that was the beginning of us in in Goldsboro. Well, and you and Ada remained friends, right? Until she she just passed recently, just passed. right? Oh, that's the making yeah. of a a good foundation for a friendship, being yeah, neighbors yeah. like that. Wow. And her her middle daughter mm -hmm. is just about five months older than Carol, my daughter. So, so they're kind of like neighbor sisters. Yeah, <laughs> and they have remained close friends. Ah, oh, that's nice. Kind of a, a family legacy. Yeah. Now, when did you start teaching? Okay. Now you in Goldsboro. Yeah. You you were a teacher before you came, yeah. and then when you came, when did you start here? Okay, six. Did you start right away? Yes. Oh, right away. The same bishop. He's very pro He was very prominent in Goldsboro. Uh huh. And uh, his church was one of the largest black churches. Mm -hmm. Now, what what was the church? Saint Mark Church of Christ. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. So he took me out there and the school had already started. Okay. And uh, introduced me to the principal. Uh huh. He was very authoritative. He said, "Mr. Wooten, this is the new doctor's wife." He's yeah. got all of those financial aids and loans he's got to pay off, and she needs a job. So, <laughs> Mr. Wooten said, well, what is your major? Well, let me see what I have. Yeah. So, uh, I said, uh, biology and chemistry. He said, all of those positions are already filled. We don't need a science teacher. We don't need a science teacher. Oh, no. So, he said, my social studies teacher... Uh, is military connected, uh -huh. and they are moving. He said, I said immediately, I can teach it. I, <laughs> now, had, had you ever taught social studies never before? Social no, studies. but. And that's all I taught from the time I went into Dillard High School yeah. until I retired. Was but social studies. Social studies. And you were darn good at it from uh, what I've heard, the reports, and uh, I've seen all the awards, mm -hmm. so I know you were good at it. Um, and so you so you started at Dillard. Yes. And now tell me the story of when you got moved to Goldsboro High School. You were th first, there were three of you guys, three African-American mm -hmm. teachers. Now tell me that story. That's an interesting story. Okay. Um, I give praise to the leadership in education and into the um, city council and mm -hmm. all 
-hmm. that Goldsboro could have been a blazing inferno like Wilmington was right Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, a, a lot of cities and were at Washington that time, DC, right? Yeah. On the TV, you could see just the in, you know, the blazing and yeah. the, the riots and all. Yeah. But we didn't have that. Uh, instead, uh -huh. uh, the year before they integrated the high school, mm -hmm. uh, they sent three of us from Dillon mm -hmm. over to Goldsboro High mm -hmm. and three white teachers over to Dillon so that the children and the staff could get accustomed to seeing teachers of a different race. That seems, I mean, that seems really smart. I mean, very progressive for the time to think in terms of for letting kids kind of get used to having somebody of a different race as an authority figure and get comfortable and so that, you know, when the time came that the transition would be easier. Yeah. And, and how hard was that for you? Well. I mean, I'm sure it's always hard to move jobs and yeah. change, but, but what did you, was there resistance? Was there... Was were people welcoming, or was there sort of, uh, well, I mean, cold. kind of cold, polite, right, and professional, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but not the camaraderie, that, right, uh, that that you had had before, right. I'm sure, yeah. But it wasn't long because I have the kind of personality <laughs> that I don't meet strangers, and <laughs> and then what the principal did. Yes. Um, on the student side. Uh huh. Okay. You always have problems with the sports and athletics and cheerleaders. Mm -hmm. So now, on the football team. Uh huh. Had a white head coach. Uh huh. But the team was integrated. Okay. But. Uh, and so, what year did the did the high school here integrate? I know it was a little later than other places, right? Well, uh, 1968 was the last graduating class, I believe, in at Dillon. And so the seg so the uh, segregated schools and then when desegregation happened, that happened 6970. 6970. That, that school year. Okay. But I want to interject. Mm -hmm. The elementary schools Yes, ma'am. Had been integrated all along. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. I was talking to um, one of my friends that uh, taught on the elementary level. Uh -huh. She said, right, real jealous a little bit. She said, uh, I was one. I was the first teacher that they sent to the uh, white elementary schools, uh -huh. K, K through four. Yeah. Well, that of all of the age groups. That would be the least strenuous, I would think, too. I would think children are very accepting, yeah. I would think. They're not as aware of race and, you know, uh, I, I would just think children would be a little more open-minded and would be an easier transition than than maybe high school. Yeah. And there's problems, too. Oh, yeah. Well, just high school kids are, yeah. I mean, no matter, in the best situation, are more trouble, right? Right. They're, they're raging hormones. I'm raging hormones. <laughs> so anyway, uh, she she was kidding a little bit. But, yeah. But she uh -huh. uh, she was one of the first black teachers sent to the white school, uh -huh. with white staff and everything. She was a good teacher. She is still living. Is she? Yeah. Oh. So I'll okay. Give you her yeah, I have to. I'll have to talk to her. Phone number. And others, and mm -hmm. it, it, and then the next year they did another grade and went on up. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was. Uh, so high school was the last. Was high school was the last. Mm -hmm. And so what Mr. Sugar had uh -huh. was cheerleaders. You tried out. Yeah. You had four black, four white, and four could be any color. <laughs> <laughs> now, now the basketball team. Uh huh. It was at that first time all black. Yeah. The tennis team mm -hmm. was all white. Uh, that wasn't the black guys and girls sport. Right. Yeah. Soccer team the same. Yeah. 
as the years passed, all of the teams integrated. Right. So had just Everybody the, played everything. Yeah, yeah. the best yeah. players in any sport. Yeah. So, uh, but that was one example. Then Mr. Sugar had us to have uh, little get-togethers uh -huh. away from school uh -huh. so that we could socialize and get, get to know each get other. Get more comfortable with, and, with yeah. each other. That's smart. So it, wasn't, it wasn't that long, I think, at the high school um, that things were more comfortable. Uh -huh. uh, it used to be a time that a black teacher could go in the teacher's lounge and people would get quiet. Really? You know, yeah. things like that. Yeah, but, uh, uncomfortable. Yeah, now Annetta graduated in the class of 74 from Goldsboro High. Uh -huh. And she recalls um, how when she was ready to go to Dillon, uh -huh. And they found she found out that they weren't going to Dillard. They had to come to Goldsboro High, High School. And she didn't want to. Because now Dillard was an outstanding school. Tell her. And oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Dillard was outstanding. Yeah, it was supposed to be one of the best schools. I mean, anywhere. you know, really anywhere. It's, it had an incredible reputation for yeah. academics. And I'm sure, yeah, having to go to Goldsboro, I mean, you know, that that would have been, yeah, kind of a, a transition on, on several levels. Oh, the students, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's why even there, after school, mm -hmm. children who weren't even in my class would come back to my room. Yeah. And uh, sometimes I'd help them with their homework, but they'd socialize in there. Uh -huh. It still was a, a matter of the, most of the black children rode the buses. Uh huh. So there was the black parking lot. Right. A lot of the white children had their own cars. And they parked over by the cafeteria. Yeah, uh, so there was, yeah, just naturally yeah, occurring separation. Separation. So many of them would come to my room, and there was another favorite teacher named Mrs. Harris. Uh -huh. She was the music teacher. Uh huh. And um, so she took a lot of them in yeah. her classroom. And, uh, so you were kind of... Um, Kind of like a like a school den mother kind of, uh. and the coach was coach of basketball was very charismatic. Uh huh. Oh, so uh, he could get along, and the kids admired him. And we had winning everything. We had good academics. Uh huh. We had good sports. Yeah. Went to the state championship almost every year. So by merging. Goldsboro High became Came better. Became better. That's great. In my opinion. Okay. Well, I wanted to talk to you. Um, oh well, d tell me uh, a little bit about. Um, we were talking about civil rights and uh, d desegregation. Now you you were talking about you know that Goldsboro didn't you know burn like some of the other cities because um, maybe there was more working together. And then I know you were part of a group, like, a, what was it, a human, human rights? Relations. Human relations. Absolutely. And tell me a little bit about that and, and kind of how that may have helped kind of diffuse some of the, the tension of the, that time during civil rights when everything was so tense racially. Uh, I told you... The lady's name that was the chairperson was a Mrs. Berkeley. Mrs. Berkeley, uh, right. Mm -hmm. Her husband was Dr. Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, very shortly after I got to Goldsboro, mm -hmm. um, people would invite me as the new doctor's wife yeah. because my husband was, in some instances, shy and very quiet. Well, you, you, you talk for both of you, yeah. right? <laughs> Whenever they would ask him to come speak at a church, or yeah. event, he would always say, ask my wife. Ask my wife. <laughs> he wouldn't go. Um, and I've forgotten some of the others, I think, or Mr. Neil Stitt. And, oh, but they um, were all on this committee. All on this committee. Mm -hmm. And we met and we talked. 
And that's my opinion. You talk things out mm -hmm. rather than violence. Right. And uh, if you're going to follow Martin Luther King, he was preached nonviolent. Now tell me about the day um, that Dr. King was assassinated. You, you were at school, I mean, when it happened, and I know... Yeah that you we had to walk out yeah you had a walk out and and tell me about that because they kind of looked to you to uh diffuse some of that right yeah well with the co everything we had co student association presidents uh huh uh, one was a white young man and one was a black girl uh huh and that summer before they became uh, seniors mm -hmm. She had to drop out, uh, didn't come back to school. So my principal, he just decided to just let the one white young man go on and serve as, as president and not have a coat. Well, that was unusual, right? Because it was kind of co-everything everything up until then. And everything up until then. And did that create a problem? Created, the children felt, the black children felt, that we had the office of co-president. And it wasn't, and it was vacant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that day, the, uh, I don't know if he was the vice president or the chaplain of the, of the senior class. Mm -hmm. He had given, passed the word that when I go to the podium, I mm -hmm. want everybody to get up and walk out of the stadium. Mm -hmm. And that's when they quoted me in the paper saying I was sitting there, Lord, oh. don't let those children right. get violent. Right, right. Uh, so uh, we had to dismiss the whole mm -hmm. uh, assembly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I got to my room, the kids were out in the bus parking lot just milling around, mm -hmm. but they weren't weren't doing anything. And um, so the principal called and said, Miss Hayes, Mr. Stitt, uh, who would I tell you the other one? Mr. Siler, mm -hmm. uh, come to the office. Right. And we got there and he said, he was disturbed too. He didn't want to go on the record that his school was in the midst of a violent riot. It had a, yeah, with the walkout, because you were afraid, I mean, it could have yeah. gotten violent, right? Yeah. That I mean, there was so much sadness and rage and, you know, that uh, it could have erupted, right? right. So, uh, anyway, because we knew some of the student leaders, mm -hmm. we called them to the office, mm -hmm. and we talked to them. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget this black guy, his name was Horace Thompson. He got on the intercom. Mm -hmm. He said, everybody go back to your classes quietly yeah. and resume your uh, studies. And that dissolved oh, the crisis. That did. Wow. Okay. And now, uh, I know besides working on uh, with the Human Rights Committee, you have been very, very active uh, in a lot of... Um, other uh, social and civic uh, organizations. Now, I know you are a member of the AKAs, mm -hmm. which is the oldest uh, African-American sorority in the United States. I think they were founded in 1908, 1908 at Howard. Is that correct? That's correct. And so they have been, and how long have they been in Goldsboro? When were they founded here? In the... Before I came, it was in the 1950s. In the 1950s, okay. And yeah. and you've been active with them. And they are, um, it's a, a college, uh, uh, okay, it's a sorority for college-educated women that does um, social and civic work. And then and tell me a little bit more about it. I, I've read the book, but I, I'm interested in hearing uh, your personal experiences with the AKAs. Well, uh, in 1908 at mm -hmm. Howard University, mm -hmm. a group of women mm -hmm. uh, sought, they were juniors and seniors, sought uh, uh, girls there that were sophomores mm -hmm. 
and organize the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. Mm -hmm. Now it, it is international. Right, right? yeah. Uh, and all over the United States, and we are hundreds of thousands of members. Right. Here in Goldsboro, mm -hmm. we now have a membership of about 110. And um, so in college, mm -hmm. it's more of a social thing. Right, yeah. We do some service projects, mm -hmm. but it's more a young thing. Yeah. We have certain colors and mm -hmm. we have certain songs. Now, what, what are the AKA's colors? Pink and green. Pink and green. Yes. Okay. And the other sorority that I told you about, the Deltas, uh -huh. is red and crimson, but we mm -hmm. just say red and white. Uh -huh. And the Zetas uh -huh. are blue and white. We okay. have our colors. We and in college, you have your songs and your dances, and yeah. you sit together. Okay, but now when in mm -hmm. the graduate chapter, uh -huh. um, you can come in as a graduate member. Uh, you don't have to have come through the college. Ah, okay. You, uh, so now, ooh. I've kind of retired because I say I have done my due and I have <laughs> had my day. Um, but our biggest um, money raising uh -huh. activity is what we call our debutante ball. Okay. Okay. We select girls mm -hmm. and present them to society mm -hmm. and um, have activities for them, uh, social training. Now, I know Mr. Lofton, Mr. Ernest Lofton, told me that he used to take a lot of the debutantes, mm -hmm. official uh, debutante portraits. Right. So, um, for our exhibit, he's going to try to find some of those uh, to uh, to let us exhibit. Yeah, he was. And you're also a member of the Continentals. I was. Right? And their colors are, I know this, red and green. Is that right? Red and green. green. Oh, Red, well, white, I and thought, green. Oh, red, white, and green. Okay, because Kamatha came, and, and I thought she told me it was red and green. But she was wearing white, too. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, um, that's more, a, it's not a, a sorority. It's a, like a social, civ, civic. Civic, yeah. Civic, right. Service. Right, and you, you don't have to have a, a degree, correct, that's to right. be a member of the Continental. Because women that will work and, to do and, service and in do the service. in the community and we have done so much in my church i was the youth director mm -hmm. for over 25 years um i gave that up so i'm more than now just a few member mm -hmm. pay my dues and yeah and, uh, and oh yeah they tell me about that the the organization of uni it's university. a university, I can't remember the acronym, the letters. N-A-U-W. N-A-U-W. Yes, tell me about that. Okay, that's another very good service uh, organization. Mm -hmm. It just highlights uh, uplifting children, giving mm -hmm. scholarships. We just do educational projects mostly. While the Continentals, they serve underprivileged and disadvantaged children primarily. Right. Mm -hmm. The AKAs, we have multiplicity uh, all, over. all over doing mm -hmm. everything. But we've got so many members mm -hmm. until supposedly it doesn't work one group more than another, but it does sometimes. Really? But see, like the Continentals used to average about 18 members. Uh -huh. NAUW has 15 members. And we are smaller. Uh huh. Um, and so, do you? It is well. You don't have to tell me on video. You can tell me after I stop rolling. If if you, which one you feel your your heart is most with? I won't make you say it on tape. <laughs> now, what I because I know you have won so many awards. I mean, you have so many trophies. As do I mean, so does your daughter. Um, but. What do you think, kind of at this point in your life, what are you most proud of, of all of your accomplishments in your life at this point? Because I know as you age, like, you know, you're proud of different things at different times, but kind of what at, at this point in your life are you most proud of? 
I am most proud of uh -huh. all my children. You know, yeah. the, the uh, soap opera. Oh. <laughs> because even though I was only blessed with one biological child, when I look over there and see Annetta, uh -huh. and the girl called Christine, and my so, husband's nephew, Jeffrey. So you have many children. Many children. Yeah. And then everybody didn't live with me. Mm -hmm. There were so many children that they tell me I have touched their life. Uh -huh. And that they wouldn't be where they are today if I hadn't, you well, know, stepped in and guided them. And well, them. even I, my sister says that about you. And you were her favorite teacher in high school. And she feels like at a point in her life, if you hadn't stepped in and guided her, that her life might have taken a different turn. So you have touched an awful lot of people. Um, and the more people I talk to in the community and, and mention your name, everybody, you know, has a story about you and how you were, you know, a teacher that made a difference in their lives. So I, I hope you know, like, how valued um, that you are as a teacher and how blessed the city is to... Uh, to have had you here to to work your magic. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that because a lot of times the children will tell me uh -huh. Annetta and her best friend the other day were reminiscing about how they'd get in the classroom yeah. and um, would get me off my lesson plan because <laughs> <laughs> they may or may not have had their report of their assignment. Oh, so they distract you. <laughs> yeah. Create a diversion. And I just would fall right in and, <laughs> <laughs> and stop. But that's the way I taught history. Yeah. By telling anecdotes and... Mate, you have to keep yeah, it interesting. Yeah. I, th I think we, that's how you keep kids engaged is you've got to find a way to interest them. Yeah. History can be dull. It can be, but, yeah. But I would tell them stories. Mm -hmm. And like uh, when when we would be... At the time when Lincoln wrote the Emancipation, mm -hmm. I told them my grandma, oh, yeah. who was about 10 or 11 years old, mm -hmm. she was the mistress, little personal maid, yeah. to comb and brush her hair and to run errands for her, mm -hmm. wash dishes. Mm -hmm. But that kept her from going to be a field slave. Right. Oh, that was tough back then, I would imagine. I would imagine. And so Grandma said that she remembers people on horseback, blacks, running, uh, coming, galloping down the road uh, when Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Mm -hmm. Said, we's free. We's free. Thank God Almighty we are free. Wow. And that's when she knew it. Of course, it took a while for the 13th Amendment mm -hmm. and, and the 14th and 15th Amendment yeah. to be signed into law. But um, so when I would tell the children that and, and even show them pictures of my grandmother. Uh, then that made it real. It made it real. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, they thought that they, Lord, we got Mr. Hayes off the subject. <laughs> 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 but partly I wanted that to happen. Yeah. But uh, it wasn't on my written lesson plan that you had to turn into the principal. Right. Well, you know, you it might have to deviate from that to keep it uh, keep it interesting, I would imagine. Oh, gosh. Thank you so much for talking to me. I so appreciate your time. And I just appreciate your, all the help and the um, guidance that you've given me in terms of uh, doing exhibits and uh, doing outreach into the African-American community and schooling me. Um, you've been, um, you know, so important. And I just thank you so much. And now I see why everybody loves you so much. And, and I love you, too. So thank you so much for your time and let me come here and, uh, and grill you. Uh, I've really enjoyed getting to know you.